The exhortation today will be by Brother Rob Scott. His subject will be exhortations from Hebrews chapter 13. In preparation for his remarks, he's asked that we read Hebrews 13, the first 17 verses. Hebrews 13, starting at verse 1. Let brotherly love continue. Be not forgetful to entertain strangers, for thereby some have entertained angels unawares. Remember them that are in bonds as bound with them, and them which suffer adversity as being yourselves also in the body. Marriage is honorable in all, and the bed undefiled, but whoremongers and adulterers God will judge. Let your conversation be without covetousness, and be content with such things as you have, for he has said, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee so that we may boldly say, The Lord is my helper, and I will not fear what man shall do unto me. Remember them which have the rule over you, who have spoken unto you the word of God, whose faith follow considering the end of their conversation. Jesus Christ, the same yesterday and today and forever. Be not carried about with divers and strange doctrines, for it's a good thing that the heart be established with grace not with meats, which are not profited them that have been occupied therein. We have an altar whereof they have no right to eat, which serve the table. For the bodies of those beasts whose blood is brought into the sanctuary by the high priests for sin are burned without the camp. Wherefore Jesus also, that he might sanctify the people with his own blood, suffered without the gate. Let us go forth, therefore, unto him without the camp, bearing his reproach. For here have we no continuing city, but we seek one to come. By him, therefore, let us offer the sacrifice of praise to God continually, that is, the fruit of our lips, giving thanks to his name. But to do good and to communicate, forget not, for with such sacrifices God is well pleased. Obey them that have the rule over you, And submit yourselves, for they watch for your souls, as they that must give account, that they may do it with joy and not with grief, for that is unprofitable for you. Let's turn our attention now to our brother Rob Scott for exhortations from Hebrews 13. Brother Rob. Morning, everyone. Happy Mother's Day to all the mothers out there. Brother Randy has asked me to perform as your speaker today and as a father of four performing for Mother's Day. So next year I'm not on this day, okay? I'm just kidding. No, just kidding. It really is hard. What can we really do in one day to show um, the mothers of our children how much we appreciate them? It's it's difficult because they do do so much and it's a thankless job. I don't think one day out of the year is really enough um, to, to show how much um, our moms do for us. Um, so Jennifer and I have been studying the book of Hebrews together. Um, we have four kids, so I won't tell you how long it's taken us, but we've been studying the book of Hebrews together and we finally got to chapter 13. Um, and, and really looking at chapter 13, trying to find some things that could be of an exhortive value, um, it gives me the excuse to jump around a little bit from point to point based on kind of what's written um, in, in the passage Brother Wayne just wrote for us. So I'm just going to go through these verses, um, some very quickly, some with more focus, and we're going to just talk about kind of what the writer is saying here um, to the Hebrews. You know, there's one approach of looking at the book of Hebrews as, you know, what was he saying at that time to those people with that problem? And then there's the approach of, you know, what does it mean to us today? So I'll kind of touch on both of those. Um, you know, I think sometimes we we can isolate chapters and, 
and, and books of the Bible into what were they saying then without applying it to today and then vice versa. So I'll try and touch on a little bit of both. Um, you know, my hope is to identify, you know, some things that we can all work on. Um, I know I need a lot of the advice in this book. Um, and I'm going to try and balance my remarks so I don't seem like I'm too strong one way or the other. So bear with me. Um, the first verse um, essentially says, let brotherly love continue. So how, how easy would it be if we could do this all of the time? Uh, we must really try to see each other as brothers and sisters. Um, I should be able to tell, you know, I don't have brothers, I have sisters, but... You know, I, and there's different depths of our relationships with our blood brothers and sisters, but generally speaking, by design, we should be able to tell our brothers and sisters anything about ourselves um, and, and not worry about losing them as a brother and sister or losing um, them as losing their love. You know, we all have conflicts with our brothers and sisters. That's what makes us brothers and sisters. But when it comes down to it, we can always rest on the fact, hey, that's still my brother. Hey, that's still my sister. Um, you know, James chapter 5, verse 16 tells us, confess your trespasses to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. So, again, that's what we do for our brothers and sisters. Um, so how do we achieve this if brotherly love isn't present? So if I've done something terrible or I'm facing an immense trial, think of it this way. Am I going to tell this guy I go to church with about it, or am I going to tell my brother? So we really have to see each other beyond this Sunday, this guy I go to church with, and truly see each other as brothers and sisters every, every Sunday and during the week. And at all times, this should be a depth of relationship that we should have. Um, so make it more than something we just refer to each other as, but instead put it into practice every day. Um, verse 2, moving on. Do not forget to entertain strangers, for by doing so some have unwittingly entertained angels. And this is something Brother Brad uh, touched on last week when we have visitors. Um, so let's fir first let's pat our back. I'll pat us on the back first. So we have visitors from time to time. So that means several things. That means that there are some people out there outside of our body of believers who see us in a certain light and would want to come and find out more about what it is that we might believe. So um, I can pick on Brother Brad even easier because he's not here today, but you know, Brother Brad had some friends that came and they came obviously because they saw something in him. Uh, we had Tracy who came for a while because he saw something in the way we believed that seemed to correspond with what he thought was the right biblical teaching. So there's two different avenues where we can attract people to come and worship with us and be with us. They believe what we believe and they like how we live our lives and, and, and maybe we're showing some light in our life that draws them here. So where's the disconnect happening um, when, when it comes to what I would call entertaining our strangers? Um, and this is myself included. So basically we can't wait for, and I get to pick on David Stanley, we can't wait for the David Stanleys and the Tim Andersons to entertain our guests every week. Because we all know that there's about two or three people that every week are the ones talking to the newcomers. And, and the rest of us are like, that's taken care of. You know, so that's me included. It's a tough conversation to have with somebody. So we really have to try hard when it comes to that. You know, and I don't have the overnight answers to how we step that far out of our comfort zone. But, you know, two suggestions. One, and this is as a body, how we practice on Sundays is that we vigorously examine what traditions we hold that create barriers to welcoming strangers and evaluate if it really comes from God's word or not. So that's something that we owe it to ourselves to look into. And, and, and we look at the issues that may have drawn, that, that may have 
been the reason people stop coming and say, is that coming from the word or is that coming from maybe a practice of ours that, that may or may not be the right approach? So I'm not giving an answer, food for thought. Um, and then two, and this is more practical, we pray for the strength and ability to show the welcoming love that we should when someone new comes, not just the first time they come, but week in and week out. And that applies to our membership as well. Um, I don't speak to everyone in this meeting every week, but I and we really need to identify who needs to be made to feel welcome more than any other. And that could be a new person or someone who is just not doing well spiritually or just not feeling good about themselves. We need to try and identify those people and make sure they feel our love. You know, if, if I came back, you know, I, I was in the world for a while. I left the faith and I came back. And when I first came back, it would be very easy for me to um, draw a conclusion because someone didn't speak to me. They really weren't thinking about me and they really weren't thinking about, wow, I'm not speaking to Rob today. But it's easy for me in that insecure state of mind when you're coming into a situation to assume that if people aren't kind to you and aren't speaking to you that maybe it's on purpose and, and that they think they're better than me or they um, don't want me here. So we really have to step up that part of our approach to our brothers and sisters as well as to the newcomer. So that's something that we can change today is making people feel welcome every time they walk through the door, not just the first time they walk through the door. Say, all right, let me go get this over with. Hey, how you doing? Welcome to the chapel. It's nice to meet you. Done. You know, so I think that's easy to do. So I've done it, you know, and it may, I give myself a little pat on the back. Yeah, I spoke to him today. Oh, yeah, I did. So we, we got to be consistent and continue to do that day in and uh, week in and week out. So simply said, don't forget to entertain strangers, truly entertain strangers. Okay. Remember, uh, verse three says, remember the prisoners as if chained with them, those who are mistreated, since you yourselves are in the body also. So we're the body of Christ, and we don't neglect any part of the body because it's not the part that we make up. So I'm a hand, and the foot's hurt. I don't neglect the foot because it's not the hand. So we, we are all the body of Christ, so we suffer together. Me, as a body, if my hand hurts, my whole body is consumed with the fact that my hand hurts. You know, even the littlest, you know, you ever smashed your finger in a car door? I tell you, that little part of, what is that, one one hundredth of your body is consuming a hundred percent of your body. So we need to think of it in those terms. And, and my wife has a saying that, that applies to mothers, as it says, you're only as happy as your unhappiest child. So if you have multiple children and one of them is doing terribly, then your happiness only equates to the level of their happiness if they're your unhappiest child. So that, that's kind of a, a good way to put it in perspective that we as a group, um, if we have someone among, in our midst who is going through hardship, it doesn't mean we have to, um, it doesn't mean we have to go as, we don't have to be consumed with, but we need to address that and help strengthen that person. Um, you know, there's the biblical principle of mourning um, in the Bible. So mourning was given its place in the Bible. You know, there are references to the house of mourning um, frequently in the Old Testament. And then the account of Lazarus, you know, you see the whole, um, for lack of a better term, kind of production that mourning was given. You know, maybe um, it doesn't have to be that, but it needs to be we mourn together. We don't just say uh, they're going through a hard time. I'll see them when they get better. You know, it, it's really we need to help people mourn with people, but we also, we rejoice with people as well. Okay. Um, so verse four, marriage is honorable among all and the bed undefiled, but fornicators and adulterers will God judge. I'm not going to speak a lot on this. This is pretty straightforward, but I would say it's a beautiful and refreshing statement that God has given us this, um, the sanctity of marriage as a place where we are undefiled. And so I think that's a beautiful thing. And, and then he creates the contrast of fornication and adultery. So it's pretty clear. 
Um, moving on to verse 5. Let your conduct be without covetousness. Be content with such things as you have. For he himself has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. So we may boldly say, the Lord is my helper. I will not fear. What can man do to me? So I, I like these verses because it helped me to kind of see covetousness in a new light. And based, maybe based on my recent experiences or something, you know, I traditionally thought that covetousness was, you know, wanting something that someone else had. Ah, that's a nice car. I want that. I'm coveting his car. You know, so very, the very simple, like, Sunday school, <laughs> I'm eight years old kind of understanding of covetousness. But I think, you know, it's more, more complicated than that. Um, it, it's more, for me, from what I understand it, is it's mistaking a want for a need. And isn't that what we do all the time? Do, do I need that or do I want that? And so we're, we're the, the king of that, aren't we? You know, it, it can apply to anything, but we frequently mistake what we want for what we need. You know, people get into all kinds of financial trouble because they mistake wants for needs. So it, it can have all kinds of implications. So, but I'm not really thinking about material things in this instance. Um, Paul tells um, in Philippians uh, chapter 4, verse 11 and 12, it says, not that, I respeak, not that I speak in regard to need, for I have learned in whatever state I am to be content. I know how to be abased, and I know how to abound. Everywhere in all things I have learned both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. So if we have work, if we have employment, why be consumed with discontent until we get the job we think we need. Uh, if we're not married, why be consumed with discontentment until we find the spouse that we think we need? There's so many things in life that we may not have that we can draw the line and, and say, this is my need and this is the only thing I'm going to focus on is this particular need. But when we look at the verse, you know, by doing this, we're putting self-imposed conditions on our happiness. So we're deciding, I'm not going to be happy until this need is met or this is done. So we're putting, we're making the conditions instead of, instead of following what the, what the verse quotes is saying, I will never, you, never leave you nor forsake you. The Lord is my helper. What can I fear? I will not fear. What can man do to me? So while it's wrong to want something that isn't yours in God's eyes, it is detrimental to the joy that God would have us to experience. So when it says, I will never leave you nor forsake you, we have to understand if God gives us what we think we need and it's not best for us, then God is forsaking us. So truly we have to turn it over to God. And truly I make the same mistake over and over and take it back on myself. I mean, over and over. I'll do it again next week, probably. But this is this is our pattern. This is this is how we. This is this repetitive cycle of not finding the joy that we could is is deciding what we think we need all the time, and then once we get that, we think, all right, what's next? You know. So we have to we have to balance how we approach our needs and truly say not my will but yours be done Lord and really mean it and that's a lifetime um, verse 7 says remember those who rule over you who have spoken the word of God to you whose faith follow considering the outcome of their conduct and then I'm going to skip down to verse 17 of the same chapter that we met and kind of pair it up with verse 7 so verse 7 and verse 17 Verse 17 says, Obey those who rule over you and be submissive, for they watch out for your souls as those who must give account. Let them do so with joy and not with grief, for that would be unprofitable to you. So it says, Consider the outcome of their conduct. So if we talk about the, the time this was written, you know, this is referring to those people who have probably lost their life or been imprisoned for their beliefs. This, this was a turbulent time in, in the first century when you know Christians were suffering um, and, and being killed for their beliefs and being imprisoned. So when it applies to us, I think 
we should use the verses to remember the biblical principles of submission and respect for our elders. That sounds so old school, doesn't it? <laughs> but, but there's a biblical principle behind it, right? 2 Timothy 2, verses 1 and 2 says, You therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus, and the things that you have heard from me among many witnesses. Commit these to faithful men who are able to teach others also. So these things have been committed to faithful people to teach us. So this is a high calling to be a teacher. And, and these things have been committed so that they may be relayed to us by people who are able to teach. And downstairs in uh, Brother Jason's class, we were talking about this today. But, you know, there's no hierarchy uh, in, in God's eyes, but there are roles that are given to people. And, and we should respect those roles um, and, and take into consideration what these people say. And I'll elaborate some more on that. And then in First Peter, well, one point, we should allow ourselves to be taught as well. We, there's no point in our life when we are beyond being taught. We have to allow ourselves to be open to instruction and, opening, and open to be taught. Um, in 1 Peter 5, verse 5, it says, Likewise, you younger people, submit yourself to your elders. Yes, all of you be submissive to one another and be clothed with humility. For God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. So here we're specifically instructed to submit to our elders. So I thought about this, and what does an elder represent? And not just an elder, but an elderly person who's an elder. What do they represent? Not just someone who is older and more experienced than us, but an elder also represents someone who is still here serving God. That's a big deal. Because someone who's 80, 90 years old, and they're still in this room, they've been through trials of their own. They've been through difficulties in marriage, difficulties in life. They've lost people in life. They've, all these things have happened to an elder, and they're still here. So they've still ultimately come to the decision that, you know, no matter what trial I've faced, no matter what difficulty I've endured, no matter what conflict I've had in life, this is where I still want to be today. And so there's something to be said for that. It, they don't just get extra points because they have white hair. They get the points because they, they've been through life and they've experienced the difficulties and hardship, but they've come to the same conclusion that they still want to be here. And I think that's the reason why we respect and honor our elders. Ephesians chapter 5, verses 20 and 21. So giving thanks... Always for all things to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, submitting to one another in the fear of God. We must submit to one another, and this balances out the whole statement. We must submit to one another whether we are teachers, elders, deacons. God gives grace to the humble. And this, what better way is there to humble ourselves than to submit to others and follow the example of Jesus in submitting to his Father's will. And then in verse 17, those remarks further highlight the great responsibility that is entrusted to the elder, to the leaders of believers. We must respect their role and not cause them unnecessary grief, as this ultimately affects those who are being led. So if, if we make difficult, if we make things difficult, difficult for the people that are leading us, it only comes back to affect us negatively. Not every problem is for an elder. That's why we have brothers and sisters. You know, it, you know I don't think our practice should be every time something goes wrong or, or we're discontent with something, we run to an elder. We have our brothers and sisters that we can confide in and that we can discuss things with. And sometimes, you know, the elders have other burdens to, to deal with as well. Um, moving on to verse 8, it says, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Do not be carried about with various and strange doctrines. For it is good that the heart be established by grace, not with foods which have not profited those who have been occupied with them. 
So again, the timeliness of these remarks, I think a conclusion would be that this verse is comparing the law of Moses and their strict adherence to this new law of grace that had been given through Jesus Christ. The saying that your heart be established by grace, not with the foods that have profited those who've been occupied with them, was essentially saying that, you know, by obsessing with the eating of the exact right foods and taking these practices to the extremes that they weren't intended to be by adding layers and layers of laws onto the law, then the following of the law was of no benefit to the Jews. They were not drawing closer to God or receiving the favor they thought they would. The simple message of the cross, however, was not to be complicated by the hand of man. Paul says to the Corinthians, for I determined not to know anything among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. Now, we can't take this verse and say that's the whole Bible. But we can say that this message was very important for this audience, the Corinthians in this case, to know. That they needed to understand that Jesus Christ and him crucified. Because they probably had the other parts. But this part was the most important thing for them to know. So... It says Jesus was the same yesterday, today, and forever. This simple message versus what man complicates, you know? And, and, and that's, what, that's what we have to, to test ourselves against. And it's certainly a longer discussion for a different day that's probably a lot deeper than I'm going to go with it today. Um, but the focus here for me and for us is that to remember that being right about something or knowing intimately about something is not what redeems us. Grace is. Now, there are many of us who know intimately about things in this room, about certain subjects, and I think that's wonderful, and it's such a blessing to have that. But we have to be careful also that we balance that with not, with not allowing us to think that it gives us favor or that we can avoid the humility that Jesus would have us to have. I think it's important that he says, don't be carried about by various doctrines. It doesn't say carried away, it says carried about. So strange doctrines, I don't think he's referring to like, all of a sudden I believe in, in something that isn't biblically supported, that would probably carry me away. But if I, if I start obsessing over all these different things, I get carried about and it, it distracts me, it distracts my purpose. Um, and serving God. So we have to be careful that we don't get carried about. And again, I'm not saying that our study should only be topical. That's not what I'm saying. More that we need to assure that it's producing the right fruit, that what we study, what we learn about God's word is producing fruit in us. I think the account in Ephesians puts a nice balance on this. Ephesians chapter 4, 13 through 15. Till we all come to the unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God, to a perfect man, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, and that we should no longer be children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine, by the trickery of men and the cunning craftiness of deceitful plotting, but speaking the truth in love may grow up in all things into him who is the head, Christ. For those of us who like digging deeply into different subjects, here's our litmus test. Are we speaking the truth in love? Like in all things that we do, we have to evaluate our motives. Is it to set someone straight or is it truly in love so that we may all grow unto Jesus Christ? Moving on to verse 10, it says, We have an altar from which those who serve the tabernacle have no right to eat. For the bodies of those animals whose blood is brought into the sanctuary by the high priest for sin are burned outside of the camp. Therefore, Jesus also, that he might sanctify the people with his own blood, suffered outside the gate. Therefore, let us go forth to him outside the camp, bearing his reproach. So, I've got this little book I found by John Carter. I think it's written on papyrus. <laughs> but, um, so, page 177, 
uh, of this book. And it talks about this. And again, this is certainly the book of Hebrews and its correlation with the law and Jesus and, and connecting them it is totally a subject for a different day. So that's why I'm just going to read this portion and this will be as deep as I'm going to go with this. But this addresses the burning uh, of the sacrifice outside the camp. It says, but the burning without the camp instead of on the altar, what does that signify? It pointed to the fact that it was not on the tabernacle altar that the acceptable offering for sin would be made. It was a prophecy that all would be done outside the Mosaic ceremonial system, outside the camp. And there it was that Jesus suffered without the gate or outside of the gate. It was not in connection with the Levitical offerings, but apart from them that Jesus suffered. He fulfilled in all ways the details of those offerings sinless but cleansed by the offering and all aspect of its typological teaching even to being crucified outside the city walls but the recognition of this fact was fatal to the continued observance of the law so this is a great illustration of how the jews could not find redemption within the tabernacle but had to go to a place of lowliness with jesus to find the grace that was offered so there's a humility there that outside and so the outside of the gates historically um, was never a place of honor you know it's where they sent the unclean people were sent outside of the gates of the city that's where the trash was burned was outside the, the, the city gates so this outside the gates has this implication of you don't want to be there and it's not a glamorous place <laughs> um, but much like ourselves, we must follow Jesus, bearing reproach for doing so. And we can't learn ourselves into God's kingdom. And we can't find salvation and become a part of, of God's kingdom by only associating with the higher roads of learning and tradition. You know, we, we feel like we don't have to get in the trenches sometimes if we can just stay up here and, and learn and and, and be edified by just one aspect, which is very important, but it has to create fruit. So we have to be humbled and we must in, essentially follow Jesus outside of the gates and, and bear the same reproach that he bore and be prepared to bear the same reproach. Humility is a requirement. Verses 14 and 15 says, For here we have no continuing city, but we seek the one to come. Therefore by him let us continually offer the sacrifice of praise to God, that is, the fruit of our lips giving thanks to his name. But do not forget to do good and to share, for with such sacrifices God is well pleased. Just a couple chapters back in Hebrews chapter 11, we read that about Abraham that he waited for the city which has foundations, whose builder and maker is God. So under the law, there were holy places, holy ground, holy ceremonies. Under the law of grace, we seek the city to come, just as Abraham did so long ago. What is so compelling about Abraham is how wealthy he was, yet subjected himself to a life of journey in anticipation of this great city to come. In the same chapter of Hebrews, we hear about the actions of Moses as well, who by faith, when he became of age, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the passing pleasures of sin, esteeming the reproach of Christ. There's that, that same phrase again, esteeming the re of reproach of Christ greater riches than the treasures in Egypt, for he looked for the reward. So we live in the textbook example of a first world country. When people think of first world, they think of America. Um, our first world problems include things like Starbucks being too far away and our internet connection being slow. So those are the types of problems we deal with in our first world country. But we too must refuse the life of sin for a season. Not that going to Starbucks is sinful, but we must refuse to serve the system of this world that we live in 
as opposed to bearing the reproach of Christ by people seeing us choose otherwise and saying, why, why do you choose otherwise? What's wrong with you? Do you think you're better than me? You know, th these are the types of things that would apply to us. I don't think we're going to get flogged in the street. I don't think we're going to get imprisoned for our beliefs. But we have to be willing to bear the social and, and um, it, the social consequences of what the reproach of Christ may entail. We must really get to a place where our faith in God and belief in his son truly moves us to seek him no matter what consequences may come. Simply put. So in closing, what do we do? We give thanks to his name, not just in our beds at night or around the breakfast table or dinner table, but we acknowledge him in every way, in every opportunity. And so many times I let these times pass in my life where, you know, I know and I've already thought about something that's happened to me and acknowledge the fact that that was truly God's hand. And, the, and it comes up in conversation and I just, I let it slip by and I don't say, you know what, God really worked that out for me. You know, how many times... Do we miss the opportunity to say that? So we have to remember there's no tradition that God considers a well-pleasing sacrifice. There's just not. That's not going to be the sacrifice that God considers well-pleasing. As the verses in Hebrews say, it is the giving of praise from our lips and the doing good and sharing that comes from knowing Jesus and God's word. This is the natural progression of where our study and understanding of God's word should lead us. That way we may be moved to service of others before ourselves and that also we may not be ashamed of the gospel message. These words of exhortation have been given to us by the writer to the Hebrews and they're perfectly summarized in verse 20 of Hebrews chapter 13 that was read for us. Verses 20 and 21 and I'll read these in closing says, Now may the God of peace who brought up our Lord Jesus from the dead, that great shepherd of the sheep, through the blood of the everlasting covenant, make you complete in every good work to do his will, working in you what is well-pleasing in his sight, through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. Thank you.